Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, and follow God's word, we're gonna be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I gonna marry? What kind of life am I gonna live? How am I gonna raise my kids? What am I gonna do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Hey, welcome to another week of the choices we face. One of the amazing things about the body of Christ is such variety in it, and it's such variety on this program too. Sometimes we have guests we interview, and sometimes we have preaching. Today we're gonna to have preaching. We're gonna hear about Jesus, light of the world. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the amazing light that's shining in the darkness that we need to see that we need to appreciate. Some of the most powerful words in Scripture, some of the most moving words in Scripture, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Sometimes we don't appreciate the gift of life, the, the fact that we are alive today is because of a tremendous act of God's love. God didn't have to create anybody. The fullness of his life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is so intense, so full, so completely, so unimaginably perfect. He didn't need anything outside himself. But because part of his perfection is perfect love, he said, I want to create a race of people that are going to have the capability of becoming, this is shocking, it comes from Peter's epistle, partakers in the divine nature. Think about that for a minute. He wanted to create a race of people who would have the capacity to become partakers of the divine nature, to somehow participate in that perfect love, that perfect communion, that perfect happiness, which is God himself that immortality, that never dying, no more tears. And the reason why you and I exist today is for that one purpose. We were created, and the purpose of our creation is to be one with God forever. But we're born into a battle. We're born into a conflict. We're born into a world in darkness. And in order for us to reach the purpose for which we've been created, we have to make some decisions. We have to accept the healing. We have to accept the light. We have to accept the salvation. We have to accept the gift. Now, not just of creation, but another totally amazing gift, the gift of salvation, the gift of being delivered from the darkness, the gift of heaven, in him was life. That's where our life comes from. It comes from God. And the life was the light of men. The life of Jesus is the light for the world. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. When you think the darkness is winning, 
It's not winning. It's going to be defeated. The light is so much stronger than the darkness. God is permitting the darkness in order to give people a chance to make decisions. He's permitting the darkness in order to give people a chance to see the light and choose for it. What the Lord has created us for is for friendship with him and with each other. He's created us for love with him and with each other. And the way it's described in scripture is that we're being prepared for the marriage feast of the lamb, where he's gonna eat and drink with us in the kingdom. But just like on earth, if there's any compulsion or force in a human marriage, it's not a real marriage. You can't have real love, you can't have real friendship without the free choice to give ourselves to another person and to accept the gift of another person. And that's why the Lord has taken the risk of freedom. You say, Lord, was that, was that risk worth it? There, there's so many people that are rejecting, was the risk, rich, risk worth it? And I think of that scripture passage where it says, there is so much joy in heaven when one sinner repents. It is such a beautiful thing when one of God's creations chooses to accept the light that's come into the world and so become light themselves little by little. It is so precious in heaven that the angels rejoice when just one person says yes to the Lord, when just one person says yes to the Lord. Can we say yes to the Lord today? Yes, yes. yes. let's say yes. yes. We say yes, Lord. Yes. We say yes, Lord, we say yes. I hope we've given joy to the courts of heaven today. I hope we've given joy to the courts of heaven today. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came to give testimony, to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness to the light. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. And this next line is so sad. He came to his own home, to, and his own people received him not. That's true despite doing more healings and miracles than any person has ever done, despite speaking with authority, the word of God himself, since he is God, and people marveled saying, this isn't like the scribes and Pharisees, nobody's spoken with such authority. Nobody's done such signs and wonders. Nobody ever could live a guiltless life, and there was nothing that they could accuse him of that was a sin. They tried to manufacture things, of course, say, hey, you, you ate grain on the Sabbath. Because they didn't want to open their hearts to the immense light that was shining in their world. But listen to this. But to all who did receive him and who believed in his name, he gave the power to become sons and daughters of God. To all who did receive him, and who believed in his name, he gave the power to become sons and daughters of God. It's so important to respond to the revelation of Jesus with faith. I believe in you, Lord. You know, one of the things that the angel taught the children at Fatima a year before Mary appeared to them, he taught them a prayer. He bowed down on the ground, with his forehead on the ground, an angel, the angel of Portugal, a big angel, coming in the shape of a 15-year-old boy. And he taught them a prayer. I believe in you. I adore you. I hope in you. And I love you. And I ask forgiveness for those who don't believe in you and don't adore you and don't hope you and I don't love you. Don't hope you don't love you. And he repeated it three times. The children did that prayer for the rest of their lives. And when I'm by myself in my room, I'll bow down to and say the same prayer. And I have pictures of St. Francisco and St. Jacinta there. 
And I'm so inspired by how they responded to the Lord. Jesus says, unless you become like a child, you won't enter the kingdom of God. Unless we accept wholeheartedly with simplicity, without reservation, the amazing gift of Jesus, we won't enter the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus says. Whenever there's a conflict between anything that Jesus says and something you've heard from some theologian, I'm going with Jesus, you know? Whenever there's a conflict between something that Jesus says and what the world's telling you, go with Jesus. Only he has the words of eternal life. Honestly, even when the words are hard, even when they're challenging, where else can we go? The only hope for the human race is Jesus. Honestly, the only hope for any person is Jesus. The only person who can rescue us from death and can forgive sin is Jesus. In fact, it says in Hebrews chapter 2, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same nature that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. The world is afraid of death. The world is in bondage to fear and anxiety, depression. The rates of suicide are climbing astronomically, particularly amongst young people. The rates of anxiety and depression are climbing. Fear is gripping the human race. People are afraid to get married. People are afraid to have children. People don't know what to think about what it means to be a man or a woman. People don't know what, what, what to deal with about viruses and economy and, and it's just fear is gripping the world. And Jesus came to destroy the devil who through the fear of death has kept, kept us tied up, kept us in bondage our whole life long. The fear of death sometimes doesn't manifest itself in death. It manifests itself with the fear of not having enough, the fear of not having enough money, the, the fear of not having good medical care, the fear of not having enough affirmation from other people, the fear of not having a lot, enough love, the fear of diminishment, the fear of getting older, the fear of losing our strength, the fear of, of, of declining. All those fears are there in our life. And Jesus came to set us free from those fears because the devil uses those fears. He uses the fear of not having enough money. He uses the fear of not having good medical care. He uses the fear of not having enough love. He uses the fear of, of physical decline to keep us locked up inside ourselves, to keep us afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid of loving, afraid of giving, afraid of serving, afraid of witnessing, fearing people more than God. Let's together renounce the spirit of fear. Because Jesus Christ has come to destroy the one who through fear keeps us locked up inside ourselves. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke the spirit of fear. In the name of Jesus, I claim your victory over fear. I, came, I claim your victory over the devil. I thank you that you have destroyed the works of the devil, and the works of the devil can be destroyed in our own life by faith in you, Jesus. Deliver us, Lord, from the spirit of fear. Fill us with the spirit of power and love and self-control. Amen. Amen. The next chapter of John, he calls his disciples. He's calling us. He's calling us to be his friends. He says, you're no longer my servants because servants don't really know what their master's doing. But I call you friends because I'm telling you what this is all about. I'm telling you why I've come. I'm telling you why I'm in the world. I'm telling you what people must do in order to be delivered from fear of death and delivered from their sins, and delivered from the kingdom of darkness. I'm telling you, you know now you're my friends. And Jesus wants us to be his faithful friends, his loyal friends, his attentive friends. That means prayer, right? That means reading God's word and believing it. That means interceding for the salvation of others. 
That means caring not just about ourselves and our own growth and holiness, but caring about the salvation of people that we meet, being willing to offer sacrifice for them, to fast and pray for them. I, I'm not telling you that, the, that when, when my wife and myself started fasting, that that's, when, that's why our, all our children came to the Lord, you know. But, but it has something to do with it, you know. Our fasting can't compel God. It doesn't make God do things. But the Lord wants us to put a little skin in the game. He put a lot of skin in the game, didn't he? He was, he was scourged. He was crucified. He said, put a little skin in the game. Like Paul said, in my own suffering, I make up for what's lacking in the suffering of Christ. But you know, we know there's nothing lacking in the suffering of Christ, but again, the generosity of God, letting us participate with him in the most important thing anybody could ever do, helping another person be delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, salvation. There's nothing more precious that we can participate in than that. We can participate in that every single day by accepting the suffering that God gives us and offering it as reparation for sin and conversion of sinners, as Mary said, and voluntarily doing sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice did the little children of Fatima do? They gave up their lunch sometimes. Sometimes they didn't drink water on a hot day. They accepted the sufferings that God sent to them. They gave up a favorite dessert. Stuff that we can do, that our flesh cries out not to do. Say, oh, that's insignificant. That doesn't really matter, you know. God will understand, you know. Just doing little things, little, little renunciations can really release grace into people's lives, and we can do that every single day. John chapter 3, I'm going to end with this, I think. I'm going to end fairly much on time, I think. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That really is a summary of the gospel. And if you're wondering how to share the gospel with somebody, it doesn't take too much to memorize that one sentence, right? But let's, let's go into it a little bit. It's all about love. It really is all about love. We exist because of love. We're saved because of love. Jesus is the light of the world because of love. God so loved the world, but one of the most extraordinary, the most extraordinary gift of love ever given was the gift of the word becoming flesh and Jesus becoming one of us and offering himself, offering his sacrifice, his suffering and his death so that we can live. And Jesus is sacrifice is enough to save the whole world. And we know that God's will is the whole human race be saved. But we need to pay attention to what the word of God says, that whoever believes in him should not perish. There needs to be an act of surrender, an act of trust to Jesus in order for the power of his death and resurrection to be released in our life. A lot of times people skip over that. Sometimes even when you read it in prayer books, they skip over the phrase about perishing. There's some editing the gospel going on sometimes. It's either eternal life or perish. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But faith is so important. I want to tell you something. One of the most important things that Jesus taught St. Faustina was that little prayer, Jesus, I trust in you. That is so important to not falter in faith or trust. I'd like to ask you right now, think about the situations you're most concerned about. Think about the situations you're most afraid could happen to you in the future. Think about the worst things that could happen to you Betrayed by a friend, abandoned by a spouse, libeled by somebody, lies told about you, false allegations about immorality that aren't true, embarrassing things from your past coming out, getting cancer, 
diabetes, die alone. And in the midst of every single situation, particularly the situations that you are personally most afraid of, I want you to say right now, Jesus, I trust in you. Say that right in those situations. Say it right in the midst of those fears. Jesus, I trust in you. And say it every day. Every time that fear comes over you again, say it again, Jesus, I trust in you because he's utterly trustworthy and he's utterly powerful and he's utterly wise and the love he has is pure and passionate and never ending and he will never abandon us. That's why we need to be able to say those words, Jesus, I trust in you. Okay, finally, even though there's lots more stuff here. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but the world might be saved through him. However, listen to this. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. But men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest this deed should be exposed. But he who does what is true comes to the light, that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been done in God. There's more light. There's more light, brothers and sisters. There's more light that the Lord wants us to perceive and wants us to receive. Let's just take a little time of prayer now to open up any areas of our life where there could be darkness lurking. Maybe we've been afraid to let the Lord's light come into that area because it may mean some painful choices. But it's the painful choices of soul surgery. Jesus is the divine physician and he only cuts when he's cutting out evil. He only cuts when he's cutting out disease in our soul. And sometimes the word of God, yes, is, it's like a two-edged sword. It gets right in there and it separates things that need to be separated. It brings light on things that needs to be light bring, brought on. Let's not leave today just hearing talks. Let's leave today welcoming Jesus' light into our soul in deeper ways. When St. Therese was dying, she only had three months to live. She only had one half of one lung still working. She was in the infirmary of her convent and somebody did something that caused her some discomfort and she made an impatient remark. And immediately she was corrected. St. Therese, that was clearly the fault of impatience. Now, if that was me, I'd kind of say, it was nothing like you. Your sin is worse than mine. Or, don't you understand I have good reason for being impatient, you just hurt me? Or, couldn't you cut somebody a little slack? I'm gonna, a little slack, I'm gonna be dying soon, you know, don't you, come on. How about a little, little brotherly, you know, compassion, a sisterly compassion? Well, that's not what she said, is it? Because she was a saint. What she said, oh good, another fault to bring to the mercy of Christ. <laughs> Don't be afraid of the light of God coming into your soul. Don't run from that light. Don't cover it over. Don't rationalize. Don't attack. Don't make excuses. Accept the healing light of Christ and Turn from your darkness and turn from your sin and turn from your selfishness and turn from your deception and let the light of God and the truth of God and the love of God bring you to another degree of freedom, another degree of ability to be the light of the world. Praise the Lord. Amen. Peter, what did you think? That was, first of all, some good preaching, brother. Mm. Very good. Very good. It's just, you just unpack the gospel. And as you were talking, I was thinking of what Jesus said. I think it was in John chapter 12, where he said, uh, believe in the light 
Actually, says, believe in the light so you can become children of God. And I, and I just want to exhort our listeners to internalize that message, keep chewing on it, receive it into your heart, and believe the light has been given to you. You have been united to the resurrection life of Jesus Christ, and that light is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if you lift your eyes to the heavens, like scripture says, and, and, and just live there with the Lord and believe it and ask him for help to, 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 to show it to you, right? Yeah. To show you, Lord, show me the light that's in me. Show me the, the power of the resurrection. Like Paul says, I want to know more about it. If you hunger for it, you're going to get it. And the Lord's going to take you out of the very fears that Ralph was talking about, the fear and the shame that cripple us and leave us in a kind of twilight or even in darkness. So be the light of the world, friends, and believe. Amen. You know, even when you were the person preaching, like I was at this time, God's showing me stuff, you know, like even watching it again today, I'm saying, wow, Lord, your word is so good. It's so clear. It's, it's so merciful. There's so much love here. And we'd just like to keep doing this week after week, bringing you the light of Christ, the word of God. And Peter's written a booklet called Hear, Fear God and Give Him Glory. I was going to say hear God and give him glory. Hear God too, but <laughs> fear God and give him glory. And we'd like to give it to you as a gift. Just call the 800 number or go to our website, renewalministries.net. Click on free booklet and we'll get it right out to you. Uh, was you, you need every day to hear the word of God. You need every day to say yes to him. You need every day to say, Jesus, I trust in you. Until next week, this is Ralph Martin and Peter Herbeck wishing the very best that the light of Christ may illumine the choices you are facing. One of the most overlooked yet foundational spiritual gifts is the fear of the Lord. The scriptures call this gift a fountain of life, a source of confidence and the beginning of wisdom. Today our culture, politics and even the church are in crisis. Everyone can see the deep division, the escalation of anger and violence and whole nations seem to be in the grip of fear. We have come to fear the wrong things, the opinions of men and losing our idols. The fear of God is not in the land and God in his mercy is shaking the nations to wake us up so we hear his word. Do not fear what this people fear, rather fear God and give him glory. In this booklet, I explain the fear of the Lord, why it is an antidote to the current crisis and how you can awaken this gift in your life. To receive a free copy, visit our website or call the number on the screen.